Andy, a Canadian government spokesman said that your art could not be described as original sculpture. Would you agree with that? Ah, uh, yes. Why uh, do you agree? Well, because it's not original. You have just been copied, a common uh, item. Yes. Well, why have you bothered to do that? Why not create something new? Ah, uh, because it's easier to do. Well, isn't this sort of a joke, then, that you're playing on the public? Ah, uh, no. It gives me something to do. He was the most American of artists, and the most artistic of Americans. So American, in fact, that he is virtually invisible to us. We look at him, and knowing little of ourselves, learn little of Warhol, because he was us, in all our innocence, ambition, and insecurity. A hard-working Democrat, a churchgoer and businessman, a social climber, empire builder, and inveterate consumer. In Warhol, the simplicity of a typical American citizen, and the simplicity of artistic genius, are so intermingled that we cannot distinguish them, nor properly credit either his Americanness or his genius. Dave Hickey. But I think he's a touchstone of the culture, and I mean more than painting and art history. I think he's a touchstone of the culture we live in, a touchstone for the entire culture of the post-war period. I think he is probably the most important artist of the second half of the 20th century, maybe the most important artist of the 20th century. If we needed to find a visual form to just distill what it's like to have been alive in the last 50 years, the image would come somewhere from the corpus of Andy Warhol. There is no way that anybody who is much younger than I am can understand how profoundly different the world before Andy and after Andy looked. You know, a supermarket before Andy looked one way, a supermarket after Andy looked another way. He literally changed the world, you know, and you change the world by changing what people look at, the priorities that they place on it. And so he changed the world, and the cultural consequences of that are really profound. He wanted it so much to be successful. He didn't want to be second rate or an underling in any way. And he didn't want to be first class or top rank either. He wanted to be a superstar. <laughs> he wanted to do a big Nova that would eclipse everything. That's all he could settle for if he was going to have any happiness in life. And, and it did happen, but the impact overall was what was important. And he would be willing to live an ordinary life as a person if he could have the experience of doing this impact on the culture. And it's not showing everybody that I'm important type stuff. It's like Zeus throwing a lightning bolt. It's the being able to throw the lightning bolt, not being Zeus, but being someone who has the power to throw lightning. That was the only thing that would satisfy Andy, and it happened. I think the reason why he has such staying power, and there isn't a proper understanding of him because he was so complex, yet he said he was so simple. But see, that was, that was another dodge to really, because uh, he's probably one of the most complex people I've ever met. I think his greatest gift was immediacy, making you see in an unmediated way, just right there in front of you with a kind of absolute frontal clarity. I think that he had that, he had a feeling for it, and a grasp of it that was unique. In addition to that, curiously enough, despite the sort of a phase like, I never had an idea, I'm just Andy Warhol, I would say that Andy was one of the very impressive artists of ideas. His art always suggests something about life that can be formulated in philosophic terms. And I think he knew that. I think that just as he got the force of personality by withdrawing into his shyness and his personality, so he got the force of ideas by withdrawing from any active assertion of ideas and letting them happen through the medium of his art, through the medium of that immediacy. It's called Blonde and a Bum Trip. Are there any marvelous? What's it about? It's, it's about um, <laughs> a naive young lady who goes to Hollywood to make it big. One narrative would be the Marjorie Morningstar narrative. I think that Marjorie Morningstar was one of his early self images. He must have signed certain works. Andy Morningstar. He shoots me up with. It's that. basically a girl from nowhere <laughs> moving to somewhere. The star narrative, a star is born. I think that's the big narrative of Andy's life. From the very start, 
He was not who most people thought he was, or what most people thought an artist should be. Born on the eve of the Great Depression, a child of enormous transformation and change, at once strangely afflicted and strangely blessed, he would come of age as America itself finished coming of age in the decades following the Second World War, as one of the greatest transformations in the history of modern culture took the world by storm. He was a ethnic Polish with a bad nose and St. Vitus dance and blotches, etc., who was gay and really, really swish and had a freaky mother and was bad with people, was probably dyslexic, a little autistic, maybe had Asperger's syndrome or whatever one of those things is. Yeah, and it would be really nice to become Lana Turner and art let him do that. It's hard to go from further down to farther up in uh, contemporary culture. Well, I think the thing about Andy and a lot of people in America who rise to the top and become very famous is that Andy had no idea of bourgeois life. He never saw it, he never lived it, but that's, I think, what he imagined. You know, I mean, that was the goal, was like normal life. Never anything normal about Andy from the first to the last, you know? He's in the ghetto, he's hanging out with Liza. <laughs> he's taking nude pictures of drag queens. You know, he's being shot by Valerie. Well, there's the fact that he was this poor boy from an immigrant family from a very deprived immigrant family. His father had died when he was young, working against every disadvantage, who was carried to very considerable success on the strength of his talent alone. That's in itself very interesting. We say it should happen a lot. It doesn't always happen, but it happened to him. By the 60s, he'd become one of the most influential artists of his day, described by some as a genius for his work in pop art from a charlatan to a visionary. He was America's high priest of pop. I mean, Andy understood that democracy and commercial culture were inextricable, I think. I mean, Andy's primary transgression was his primary gift, is that he was okay with commerce. And by just saying, yes, yeah, there, that's what I do, you know world changed the world. In three astonishing years, at the dawn of the 1960s, Andy Warhol would turn the art world upside down and take American culture by storm. Radically revising the meaning of art and our sense of what a painting could be, he would take the idea of art in the age of mechanical reproduction to its logical extreme, permanently breaching the wall dividing fine art and commerce grasping as no one before or since the function of fame in a mass society. He would force us to confront and re-envision the world we live in, permanently transforming the way we see the world around us. Along the way, he would transform himself, rising from the humblest of backgrounds to become the most famous and famously controversial artist of his generation, at once fulfilling the promise of the American dream and at the same time redefining it, reinventing it, and calling it into question. There's no way to really plumb Andy's instinctive selfishness. In other words, Andy did nothing but try to make the world safe for Andy. But in order to do that, he had to exercise such a profound cultural paradigm shift that, uh, you know, there's no end. I know there's no end of the people that I know who were empowered and given permission and socialized, you know, on, on the occasion of Warhol's production, you know. You know, I mean, he issued this sort of nationwide permission that uh, really freed America from World War II, in my, in my mind. I mean, it really marks the beginning of the post-war period. Andy's idea that we all should be on TV, that we all should be famous for 15 minutes. All of this is just outrageous. You know what I mean? I mean, it is anti-elitist in the extreme, but it's also, you know, a new world. You know, I mean, the pop world was a new world. All of a sudden, you could see the idea that America could come together. You know what I mean? That there was that promise there. 
that vision of some kind of synthesis. It's straight people and queer people and rich people and poor people and movie people and literary people. And, you know, I mean, and it was all coming together. I think that Warhol's desire to film everything or to tape everything or to redact or reduce everything to some kind of artistic embodiment was a form of transubstantiation. I mean, I think his philosophy of art and of life was to take a, a possibly unbearable and chaotic reality and pass it through the looking glass of some medium and ideally subject those raw data to as little manipulation as possible. Maybe not even be there behind the camera or not even use one's hand to essentially silk screen reality and make it new. And I think all of his, his search for different media, TV, um, movies, books, paintings, sculpture, performance, was an attempt to play again and again this trick of transubstantiating garbage and making it valuable. It is a fascinating fact that Andy was one of the visual artists, one of the great visual artists of his period who dreamt of going to Hollywood. At one point, he thought of renaming the factory Hollywood. At the same time, he was an artist with, well, among his many talents, could not be found any talent for narrative. He couldn't tell a story, didn't know anything about telling a story. So here is an artist with zero talent for narrative whose life, nonetheless, is like a novel. It's completely coherent. His story was one of the things that was most compelling about him, which people got and understood about him right away. Even though his genius was for immediacy and for absolute refusal to tell a story. Just, this is it, this is it, nothing more, nothing before, nothing after, not where we're going, not where we've been, just right now. But at the same time, what happened to the man was a novel. And everything about it had a kind of strange and powerful coherence. I think that he was an artist dealing with immediacy, intensity, vividness, power of connection, and the threat to all that that comes with death. And that was a powerful narrative force in his life. He lived it whether he wanted to or not. I think the reason is that Andy was really attuned to some very large issues, despite his famous superficiality. And one of the things is that immediacy, especially in the great traditions of the Romantic movement, is always on the edge of death somewhere because we're always losing the moment. It's always vanishing, you know? It's like Faust says to the great moment given to him, linger yet a while, thou art so fair, right? And yet it's gone. And that going, endless going, was something that Andy was, was really a genius about. I try to think of what time is, and all I can think is, Time is, time was, Andy Warhol. And his background, like everything else about him, was so odd and so vague. I mean, he came from nowhere in so far as there is nowhere in Europe. The people were incredibly poor and they had this faith. I think again, the faith kept them going. I mean, they had no money. They left the area when it, as soon as they possibly could because there was so little work and so much poverty. His parents were from a part of Central Europe called Ruthenia, which is on the borders of what is now the Ukraine, Poland, Slovakia, and Romania. When they came to the United States, they lived in the Slavic ghettos, but as one of Andy's brothers said to me, we didn't really know what we were. We knew we weren't Polacks, we weren't Honkies, which is their word for Hungarians. We spoke this language called Slavish, they'd call it. Basically, Andy grew up in something that looked like and felt like and acted like a Central European ghetto completely surrounded by America. You know, I mean, that is, if you've been in that neighborhood, 
in Pittsburgh and you've been in Czechoslovakia, you know, physically, that's the same place. And if everybody's talking Slovak and everybody is living in village ways, and then you're totally surrounded by all of this iconography and everything, you've got to both see the connections and see the differences. And I think that Warhol understood the power of that. He had that sort of romance with America, but just the giant distances, you know. He was born Andrew Warhola on the 6th of August in the summer of 1928 in the tiny low ceiling bedroom of his parents' house in Pittsburgh, the third and youngest son of Andre and Julia Warhola, hardworking immigrants from the heartland of Central Europe. One of his first childhood homes in a working class slum strung along the polluted waters of the Monongahela was the worst place I've ever been in my life, he later said. Two drab rooms on the second floor of a narrow brick row house, so cramped for space that he and his brothers, Paul and John, had to sleep together in a single bed. And I remember three houses like that before my dad bought his house on Dawson Street. First thing, Andy was six years old and he asked me, uh, is there a yard? Because we didn't have no yard where we lived before. We lived like in two rooms with an outside toilet. Then he says, is there a bathtub in that house? I said, yeah, we got a whole bathroom in there again. He was real happy about it. I gave my dad a lot of credit coming over here, didn't know the language, and he saved up enough of money that he bought that house cash, $3,200, I still remember. All through the Depression, his mother, Julia, a strong-willed, idiosyncratic, deeply loving woman with a knack for drawing and a beautiful singing voice, helped bring in money any way she could, cleaning houses for a dollar a day and making floral bouquets from tin cans and crepe paper which she sold door to door for a quarter apiece. I still remember her when we were small. We didn't have no radio or TV to keep you quiet. And in the winter, she'd tell us to come in the kitchen and she'd say, all right, somebody draw a picture of a cow, you know, and then the one that draws the best picture will get a prize. So what she did, she bought a, the Hershey bars for nickel, real big, you know. Andy would always win, you know, she'd, she says Andy had the best picture, you know. She had a lot of influence on Andy, you know. She started him out when he was small, and I guess it, it just took off on him. He stuck to his art since he was like about five or six years old. Every Saturday night and Sunday morning, Andy and his mother made the three-mile walk to St. John Chrysostom, a small Byzantine Catholic church filled with incense and lit by candles where they sat through the long services conducted entirely in Old Slavonic, which always began with an exorcism of the devil. Andy, as a little boy, was taken by his mother to Vespers, a Saturday night ceremony service, and then three masses on Sunday morning, back to back. And they have this iconostasis, which is a grid, these screens that cover the altar and are only opened up during the communion service. So he was eight hours a week looking at this iconostasis, a little child, you know, taking it all in. And what he was seeing was a grid of portraits of the saints, very two-dimensional with gold leaf backgrounds and perhaps nine on either side, maybe 18 altogether. I mean, which is so much like his work, you know, especially his portraits. They've got this simplicity and this sense of color and this iconic quality that comes right from that sort of Byzantine, Eastern Rite kind of art. I noticed where he was different when we picked up size to play, you know, softball, and he was out in the field. We'd play like about five or six innings, and then here somebody hit the ball out where Andy was supposed to be, and Andy wasn't there. He was sitting in front of. Uh, on the steps in front of the house, and he was drawing pictures of, uh, like, flowers and uh, butterflies. And that's where I noticed he was different, you know. From the very start, it was clear to both Andre and Julia that there was something different about their youngest child. Pale-skinned and frail-looking, bright-witted but high-strung, and prone to accidents and ailments of every kind, he refused to take part in rough-and-tumble games, from an early age, clearly preferred the company of girls and was so excruciatingly shy 
that he was often unable to enter a room where his own family had gathered, curling his hand around the doorway instead to show off pictures he was particularly proud of. Not long after his eighth birthday, he contracted the illness that would permanently alter the course of his childhood, when an episode of rheumatic fever developed into a severe case of St. Vitus dance, a disorder of the central nervous system characterized by extreme and often frightening mood swings and by uncontrollable spasms of the arms and legs. School, challenging from the start, now became a nightmare for him. The disease made it difficult to tie his own shoes or to talk without slurring his speech. When he tried to write on the blackboard, his hands shook so violently that his classmates erupted in gales of laughter, sending him back to his seat in tears. He eventually had to withdraw from school entirely and be confined to bed for months. I always had a theory about Andy and his work, and I don't know where it came from. He got this wonderful idea that there was something remarkable about staring at something for a long time, which is probably what somebody does who's awfully lonely in his life. He always said that he had 13 nervous breakdowns before he was 13 years old. And I would think that one of the things that happens to somebody like that is uh, to try to keep yourself sane. You, you stare at an object, you somehow concentrate. And I've often thought that you can look at something like that and bring qualities to it that because it's such a common object, you sort of don't even think about. The prolonged illness permanently scarred him inside and out, leaving him with a mysterious albino-like loss of pigmentation in his skin. Large reddish-brown splotches all over his face, arms, hands, and chest. An almost crippling anxiety about his physical appearance and a lifelong hypersensitivity to touch. Determined to coax him back to health, Julia transformed the Warhola dining room into a 24-hour sick room, where for months he convalesced, whiling away the long days filling in coloring books, cutting out paper dolls, making collages out of pictures cut from movie magazines, and listening to the new family radio. He was this lost little boy in this house where nobody spoke English. He was sickly, he was effeminate, you know, he, the other kids made fun of him. And he would write away in the fan magazines for autographed photographs of the movie stars. And he would read these fan magazines. He just somehow, absorbed this mass culture, you know, like right at its root, where it really started, the Hollywood promotion machine of the 1920s and 1930s, you know? That's where it really began. Awkward and painfully vulnerable on the outside, he became the absolute master of his own inner world, capable of intense and almost obsessive feats of focus and concentration, spending hours at a time poring over his artwork, and his collection of cherished images. He developed a particular obsession with Shirley Temple, rode away to her fan club, and received in return a glossy photograph signed personally by the child star, which he venerated with an intensity that rivaled his mother's passion for the icons of her church. By his side much of the time was Julia herself, warmly urging him on, triumphantly rewarding each finished picture with a bar of chocolate, all the while chattering away in a musical mixture of Roussine and broken English. They were very close. They were children together. When he was sick and stayed home from school, she was nearby, and he recognized absolutely that she was a central figure in his life. It's a secret workshop, what went on in Julia's kitchen, Julia Warhol's kitchen. I don't know if I have the answer, except that maybe his answer is, Turn to the least likely source to get your art lessons. You know, imagine that Warhol learned more about how to be an artist from Shirley Temple and Lana Turner and Julia Warhola than he learned from Duchamp, Jackson Pollock, Picasso. You know, his art has the maternal inscription in it. Eager to nurture her youngest son's artistic gifts, Julia enrolled him at the age of nine in a series of free art classes given by the Carnegie Museum of Art. Every Saturday morning, he would make his way across the steep ravine that separated the working class world of Dawson Street from the spacious precincts of Shenley Park. Sometimes spending hours at a time after class was over, wandering through the galleries, 
carefully studying each painting and sculpture. It was his first exposure to the world of fine art and to a life beyond the narrow confines of Dawson Street. Andy was short of his 14th birthday when my father died. He was on a job in uh, West Virginia and uh, they were moving some heavy equipment and uh, there was a spring that was in the summer and uh, all the men uh, drank the spring water and here it was contaminated, they didn't know it. They all got sick and uh, he's the only one that uh, didn't pull through. For three days, his father's body was laid out in the living room of the tiny house on Dawson Street. Terrified of seeing his father's corpse, Andy hid upstairs under a bed, weeping uncontrollably and refusing to come out. He just didn't want to see Dad, his older brother Paul remembered. My dad, five days before he passed away, he told me he was going to go to the hospital. And he says, that, uh, I just want you to make sure that you pay the taxes so you, you don't lose the house and keep that $1,500 for Andy's tuition for school. He says he's going to go to a college someday. You'll be, you'll be proud of him. Two years later, the family was dealt another crushing blow when Julia was diagnosed with cancer of the colon and had to have an emergency operation to remove her large intestines. Did Mama die was all Andy could say to his older brother, John, after the surgery was over. She was in a hospital for about six weeks. And uh, Andy would come from school. I'd make a sandwich, and I'd just open up a can of tomato soup. So I must have probably made it just about every day, you know, soup and a sandwich for about six weeks when my mother was in a hospital. In the end, Andre Rojola's confidence in his youngest son's gifts would not prove unfounded. All through high school, he remained a lonely, undistinguished student, still hampered by dyslexia, odd-looking and shy, and utterly uninterested in dating girls a disinclination Julia stubbornly refused ever to acknowledge or come to terms with. But he astonished his teachers with the dedication he brought to his courses in drawing, and by his senior year had become an assured draftsman with a special gift for portraiture. A more talented person than Andy Warhol I never knew, one teacher remembered. He was magnificently talented. Shortly after his 17th birthday, on August 6th, 1945, the day the first atomic bomb was dropped on Japan, he enrolled as an art student at Carnegie Tech, his way partly paid by the postal bonds his father had set aside for him. The baby in a class of returning veterans, many four and five years his senior, he was remembered by one teacher as a small, thin boy who had a great talent for avoiding personal contact. Threatened with expulsion after failing to pass a daunting first-year course called Thought and Expression, he worked furiously to redeem himself over the summer, speed sketching street scenes in the increasingly fluent style he had begun to make his own. The remarkable drawings helped convince the faculty to reinstate him, and that fall brought him the Institute's coveted Leiser Prize, which carried with it a $40 award, the first money he ever received for a work of art. It was very apparent to all of us that Andy was extraordinarily talented there was this marvelous quality. Andy was a very young person. He liked to laugh. He was very naive and left himself open in a way. He was like an angel in the sky at the beginning of his college times. But only for then. That's what college gets rid of. Philip Perlstein. Still painfully self-conscious about his looks and especially about his prominent acne blemished nose, which had prompted his brothers to give him the nickname Andy the Red-Nosed Warhola. He confided mainly in women, never spoke about his sexual interests. Like most of his peers, was not yet sexually active, but was quietly assumed by most friends to be homosexual. I think Andy had this indefinable quality of the holy fool, utterly unlike any other human being. I'm not saying he was in touch with God or anything, but he just was different. As I say, very passive. Things happened to him. He was a witness rather than a participator in life. And this, in a curious way, protected him. I always felt that there was some kind of 
um, divine protection of Andy. I mean, he was delicate, fragile, vulnerable in lots of different ways. But there was this sort of curious iron faith that kept him going. I think Carnegie Tech, in some ways, both sharpened Warhol's skills, but also gave him something to push against. I mean, he really didn't follow the, the course at all. He wasn't a follower, mostly because he had a very different idea of what he wanted to do. The other thing that he discovered, which was a really radical invention for him, was the use of what's called a blotted line technique. What it is, of course, is to take ink and to make a drawing on one paper and take another piece of paper and blot it on top. It's really a monoprint, essentially. And in finding that technique, Warhol found a key to something. First of all, he could make many images from one drawing, the fundamental basis of his career. But he also created something that looked printed. And that's very different than just the original line. This became a technique that he experimented with throughout his career. And the other thing is, I think by going to Carnegie, he realized that there was a world beyond Pittsburgh and that he had to go to New York. As graduation approached in the spring of 1949, his thoughts turned increasingly to New York. His mother did everything she could to dissuade him from going, warning he would end up dead in the gutter without a penny in his pocket. But in the end, nothing could dissuade him. So he told my mother, he said, you know, I'm gonna have to go to New York. He says, that's a place where they have a lot of magazine companies, and he had the right idea, you know. So I remember I took him down a station, down a train station, I'd give him $50. He had some money saved up. In the second week of June, 1949, he said goodbye to his mother and brothers and boarded the overnight train for New York with his friend, Philip Perlstein. The next morning, just after dawn, he emerged into the vast echoing Valhalla of Pennsylvania Station and stepped out onto 7th Avenue. He had $200 in his pocket and a portfolio of drawings under his arm. He was 20 years old. Behind him lay Pittsburgh, before him the vast sprawling city of his dreams. For the next four decades, it would be the only place he ever really felt at home. You have to remember that in the art world, the strength up until the Second World War, and for a hundred years, the strength was in, in France. And the schism that absolutely broke it was the Second World War. We kind of dominated the world after the Second World War. And first generation painting, abstract expressionism, spearheaded by Pollock, occurred. And it was absolutely the dominant style. Andy very well knew that. Everybody knew that. I think that he wanted the same thing that many major artists and many minor artists and many failed artists have wanted. He wanted to be very famous. It was very important to him. Being famous, being very successful at what he did was a mode of survival. I think that Andy would have seriously considered the possibility that life without it is not worth living. And he was ready to go all the way to do it. He was really driven in that way. It had to work. It had to work. And I don't think he spent an hour of his life without thinking of how to make it work. I'm not certain he knew what he wanted to do. He was young, he had a talent, he had to make a living. I think that he always had admired what fine artists were. He certainly knew, you know, the difference between what a commercial artist was and a fine artist was. When he arrived in 49, it's of course the moment that Jackson Pollock is being portrayed in Life magazine as the famous Jack the Dripper. 
And it's quite interesting in that sense that there's almost a notion of a kind of, I don't want to say superstar, but, you know, certainly uh, that was not an insignificant thing, and I'm sure it impressed Warhol in that way. He suddenly saw that maybe an artist could be as famous as a movie star. But like Pearlstein, he came up in a generation that didn't believe you could make a living off of being a fine artist, so you had to do something else. And of course, the very first job he gets is uh, to work for Glamour magazine, where he's hired by Tina Fredericks, who was the art director, illustrating shoes for an article prophetically called Success as a Job in New York. Few people ever rose more swiftly in the cutthroat world of commercial art than 20-year-old Andy Warhola from Pittsburgh. In the third week of June, 1949, he moved into his first apartment in Manhattan, a grimy, roach-infested sixth-floor walk-up on the Lower East Side, the first of many he would share with friends over the next two years. The next morning, he made his way to the headquarters of Condé Nast Publications on Madison Avenue, where he presented his portfolio to the art director of Glamour magazine, Tina Fredericks. I greeted a boy with a big beige blotch on his cheek, possibly going up to the forehead. He was all one color, weird. There seemed something other-earthly or offbeat, different, for sure, elfish, from another world. He had a breathy way of talking. His voice was slight, unemphatic, whispery, covered over with a smile. Struck by the quality of her visitor's drawings, Fredericks gave him a sample of shoes to draw as a test assignment. Two months later, his first published drawings ran in the September 1949 issue of Glamour magazine. When the typesetter omitted the final A in his name, he made no effort to correct it, and for the rest of his life, called himself simply Andy Warhol. He was on his way. The extraordinary apprenticeship he would serve over the next 10 years would lay the groundwork for everything that came later. Throughout the 50s, he's earning his living as a commercial illustrator, and he becomes increasingly successful, although he's successful almost from the beginning. He's working for art directors, magazines, record companies, producing a whole variety of art really made for reproduction. And he becomes very famous for a kind of line that he didn't necessarily invent, but certainly becomes his signature line. It's called the blotted line. And this was the technique he perfected. It, it led to a sort of simplified kind of drawing. And that was part of the essence of the Warhol illustrational style. And it had almost a kind of naive effect, so that it had a kind of air of having not been done with great skill, but almost awkwardly. This line is something that a lot of the art directors are attracted to, principally because they said it had a printed feel to it. You know, when something's printed, it implies that it's wanted by more than one person. It's in print, and you know, to this day, we still live in a culture where we want things in print. It becomes the famous 15 minutes of fame, if you will. He had to deal with art directors who constantly needed to perfect an image, who had to get an image that would communicate to not just one person or 10 people, but tens and hundreds of thousands of people. So he saw something, perhaps more than his other illustrator contemporaries did, about what makes an image communicate. Throughout his career, Warhol understands scale, he understands texture, understands movement of the eye. He understands how to make a composition, but he also understands something that I think makes him probably one of the most extraordinary figures since Matisse, and that's how to use color. His sense of color is just unbelievable. And then on an aesthetic level, I think Warhol had a great capacity for finding permutations within the same. A great capacity, which is evident throughout the 50s, and of course is the hallmark of his later work, to find a single image, a single theme, if you will, and to endlessly, endlessly change it 
to mine a territory that was very narrow to some extent and then push it as far as you could was something that printmaking made absolutely possible. To find the difference, to really find the difference. What happens if you make it red, if you make it yellow, if you make it pink, if you make it blue? The capacity of his mind seems without boundary in that kind of way. Throughout the 1950s, Warhol's aesthetic activity was primarily in drawing. And that technically remains at the core of his aesthetic gifts. He was a brilliant draftsman, utterly brilliant and highly developed draftsman, and became better and better at it. We think over the course of the 50s, we haven't cataloged or counted them yet, but there must be thousands of drawings. And I don't even know how to say at this point whether when we say thousands of drawings, we mean his commercial work or the work that he didn't do for commercial purposes or how we begin to distinguish those purposes or not. There's always a parallel in Warhol. He's got the work that he makes for really a public realm, if you will, which is in advertising. And then in the private realm, he's doing books, principally promotional books that he sent out to his clients all the people that he worked for in the ad industry. In the bottom of my garden, various books where he's actually already beginning to mimic what is the basics of silkscreen design. I think that the work he did as a fine artist in the 50s when he was also doing commercial work is some of his most arresting stuff. It's the nudes. He did a lot of freehand drawings from live models, and they're really amazing. If you look at the boy drawings, for instance, they're all about touch. There's this contour line that almost seems never broken, as if he never lifted his eyes from the subject, and his hand kept moving constantly over the contours of the young man's body. Touch becomes almost alive, animated in the drawings through not just the hand, not just the fingers. This is not some insipid notion of touch. This is a touch that totally electrifies the entire body. By 1951, he had begun to make enough money to move into an apartment on his own, a tiny basement flat on East 75th Street. He had also cemented a reputation, not only for the freshness and quality of his work, but for his odd personal style his unfashionably thick glasses, battered sports coats, and caved-in shoes, and for his oddly endearing habit of presenting his work, not in crisp portfolios, but in brown paper bags. Up and down Madison Avenue, art directors took to calling him Raggedy Andy, an Andy paper bag. Yeah, I mean, I think Andy probably was a genius. I know that he had a, just, a, just an incredible tactical sense of what went. You know, I mean, he liked to make it beautiful, and he knew he could. I mean, he's a professional illustrator. And he can make it beautiful, and he can make it look good, and like make it edgy, and he could do it every time. And he liked doing it every time, and he could do it without even doing very much. You know, he could come in afterward and do that that made it OK. From whence drives the confidence and the arrogance and the enthusiasm. I mean, you know, I mean, he felt like he could do it all day long, every day. I felt if he wasn't doing it, he was wasting time. Uh, he liked to do it. it, you know, it terrified people. You know, I mean, he was a genius. And yet from the start, the success that came so easily in his work would prove painfully elusive in his private life. He was over 25 in 1953 when he had his first tentative sexual encounter with a picture clerk he had met at the New York Public Library named Carl Willers. Though the attraction was mutual, Warhol's paralyzing anxiety about his physical appearance doomed the affair from the start. He was acutely self-conscious, Willers remembered. He thought he was totally unattractive, too short, too pudgy, grotesque. A conviction so crippling, he could barely bring himself to risk the intimacy sex required. And according to Willers, almost never did, preferring the role of the observer to that of the participant. Desperate to transform himself, while still in his 20s, he had his nose reconstructed and his skin surgically sanded, without much success. There was even less he could do about his greatest source of distress, his rapidly thinning hair. He had already purchased a realistic light brown wig, when for reasons he would never quite explain, 
he chose to replace it with a dubious looking gray one. The first of hundreds he would come to possess in the years to come, ranging from light silver to blinding white. Inside, he was a very beautiful person. That's what I really liked about him. But he had an enormous inferiority complex. He told me he was from another planet. He said he didn't know how he got here. And he wanted so much to be beautiful, but he wore that terrible wig, which didn't fit and only looked awful. Charles Lisenby. Even stronger than his craving to transform himself physically was the obsession that had haunted him since childhood, his hunger for fame and dream of becoming a star. Not long after moving to New York, his obsession found a new object to attach itself to. In 1948, Truman Capote's first novel was published. It was called Other Voices, Other Rooms, and the photograph of Capote on the dust jacket became utterly notorious. Warhol was so taken with this photograph that he began to write fan letters to him. And then when he moved to New York, he began to telephone him, write more, and essentially stalk him. He wanted everything that Truman Capote had. Blonde looks, ubiquity, fame, verbal powers, precocity. Truman Capote was the literary Shirley Temple, really the child star. And so Andy sort of wanted to be Truman Capote. In fact, there are stories of him trying to actually be mistaken for Capote, of believing that somehow he looked like Capote or could begin to look like Capote. I remember the stories about him and, and Truman. He hung around Truman's front door, so to speak, and wrote little notes to him. Happy Wednesday, happy Thursday, happy Friday. I think Truman was sort of put off by this after a while. Capote, for his part, simply ignored the mounting pile of mail from his obsessed admirer, whom he dismissed, he later said, as one of those hopeless people you know nothing's ever going to happen to, just a hopeless, born loser. As far as I knew, he added, he was a window decorator. Warhol was stung to the quick by the rejection, but turned the humiliating episode into the occasion of his first art exhibit in New York, which opened on June 16, 1952, under the title 15 Drawings Based on the Writings of Truman Capote. None of the pieces sold. His fascination with a Truman Capote is a medium for him is a kind of conduit for him for becoming an artist, for becoming a certain kind of artist. And he pursues that relentlessly throughout his life. It could be Edie Sedgwick or it could be Truman Capote, but they're really not the objects of his desire so much as the medium of his desire. Central to all of it was his art, it was how you create yourself, how you transform yourself. Whatever you are deep down, it's how you become what you become. He was still recovering from the Capote disaster in the spring of 1952, when the doorbell rang one evening in his second floor apartment on East 75th Street. Down on the steps below, he found his mother, Julia, carrying two heavy suitcases, an armload of shopping bags, and the news that she had sold the family house back on Dawson Street and come to New York to live with her youngest son. At least until he found a nice girl, she said, settled down and started a family. Worried about how his mother would fit into his new way of life, Warhol reluctantly agreed to let her stay, just until he got a burglar alarm, he said. In the end, the two would live together for the next 20 years, until just before her death in 1972. During that time, though he would keep her largely screened from public view, and never fully outgrow the embarrassment he felt about her broken English and old world ways. He would come to depend on her, both for her housekeeping skills and her artistic sensibility, often pressing her into service, coloring in and hand lettering his commercial prints, as well as the private drawings and handmade booklets he sometimes gave out to clients. She won an award for a record cover design as Andy Warhol's mother. She copied in her wonderful handwriting, prose text about a street artist named Moondog for prestige album cover. And on the album cover, it said Andy Warhol's mother. 
Almost immediately, the advantages of the arrangement became patently clear. With Julia around to manage the household and help out with his art, he was free to work even longer hours, increase the number of assignments he took on, and bring in more money than ever. And he was doing illustrations at that time, but very successfully working for a very famous ad agency, making really quite a lot of money, and he was celebrated as a graphic artist, but enormously interested in the art world. You cannot be famous as a commercial artist. You're known in the field, right, no matter how successful. And he hungered for fame. Eager to find a larger audience for his distinctive private drawings, he took his portfolio to dozens of galleries around the city, but no one would take his work. I was well known as a commercial artist, he recalled, but if you wanted to be considered a serious artist, you weren't supposed to have anything to do with commercial art. He had given a group of paintings to Philip Perlstein to take to the Tanninger Gallery, which was a cooperative gallery that all the Abex painters were involved with a series of paintings of boys kissing boys. And Philip Perlstein, I must say, as a good friend, brought them there. And of course, they, you know, thought this was just absurd. Everything about his work, its figural style, commercial provenance, and homoerotic edge, doomed it in the world of fine art, which had been dominated since the end of the war by the sternly anti-figural precepts of abstract expressionism. By the 50s, abstract expressionist painting was very much the house style. It was very much the national style. It was very much the international style. And it rested, of course, on three things, perhaps. Its abstractness, its absence of a knowable or recognizable image, on its visual painterliness, but most important, on its revelation of the interiority, the soul, the spirit of the artist. Great art was supposed to be like that, was supposed to be about that. Warhol's art was quite visibly not about any of those things. Although I think it's very much about the artist as well. I think there was a sense, the myth, whether it was true or not, the myth was that the abstract expressionists were a set of tough, hard-drinking heterosexuals. And here was Andy, this shy, fey homosexual. And the whole rhetoric of abstract expressionists was all about the struggle of to express yourself in this effeminate commercial culture, you see. In the end, the only places willing to show his work were a fashionable ice cream parlor on the Upper East Side called Serendipity that also served as a meeting place for gay men, and a little-known gallery right next door called the Bodley where in the winter of 1956, a sample of his boy book drawings went on display without attracting a single customer. Oh my God, Warhol lamented, bombed again. His love life, meanwhile, was faring no better. In the summer of 1956, on a two month trip to the Far East with a handsome set designer named Charles Lisenby, his infatuated attempts to consummate their relationship were pointedly rejected in a hotel room in Honolulu. On their return to New York, heartbroken and humiliated by the experience, Warhol picked up his bags at the airport and walked off without saying goodbye or once looking back. He had gone around the world with a boy, he later told a friend, and not even received one kiss. I was walking in Bali. And I saw a bunch of people in a clearing having a ball because somebody they really liked had just died. And I realized that everything was just how you decided to think about it. Sometimes people let the same problems make them miserable for years when they should just say, so what? That's one of my favorite things to say, so what? I don't know how I made it through all the years before I learned to do that trick. It took a long time for me to learn it. But once you do, you never forget. Well, people say that Andy stopped caring after that. Um, it seems a little bit like a myth. It meant that he gave up his 
sentimental strategies of the 50s in favor of a colder, more mechanical style in the 60s. I think he realized that he could master the world by seeming not to wish to master it. I mean, he conquered a paradox by stopping to care. As the 1950s came to a close, Warhol's career seemed to have reached a kind of impasse, personally and artistically. By 1959, after 10 years in New York, he was without question the most well-known, highly paid, and sought-after commercial artist in the city. Before the year was out, he would purchase an entire four-story townhouse on Lexington Avenue on the Upper East Side, installing his mother in the basement and filling the upstairs rooms with his burgeoning collection of fine prints and paintings, including works by Picasso, Magritte, Miro, Clay, and Brock. By then, however, a crucial transformation had begun to take place in his own work as an artist, the harbinger of far more radical changes that would soon begin to sweep across the landscape of American culture in the 1960s. That the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. There's going to be a new movement and a new kind of person, he repeatedly told his friends. And you could be that person. They always say that time changes things, he added but you actually have to change them yourself. In the months and years to come, as one of the most dramatic and eventful decades in the history of American culture got underway, the force of those changes would catapult Warhol to the very center of the art world, dramatically transform the meaning and practice of art in America, and alter forever the way people grasped the world around them. These things happen periodically in the culture. You know, culture is, human culture and planetary culture is organic. It goes through refreshing periods, refreshing periods, and then it gets stale. So what you call like a revolutionary thing is really just a new fresh plant growing up, you know, and pushing the other aside. And the coming together in the 60s of the stars, New York as the center of the art world, a new generation of American artists who were really brilliant and geniuses and ingenious all struck. I think that's one of the things that people forget is that real paradigm shifts in the art world completely redo it. Just as the world of abstract expressionists destroyed all the previous galleries, destroyed all the previous dealers, marginalized all the culture as it exists and put themselves in power, so the world of pop and minimalism did the same thing. It wasn't just new artists, it was new dealers, new collectors, new everything. Andy understood that you cannot change the art, you change the society, you know, and it's what art does. I mean, part of the function of art, I think, is to change society, but it can only do that by changing art society. The first distant rumblings had come in the winter of 1958, when a 28-year-old painter named Jasper Johns sent shockwaves rippling through the art world with his first one-man show at Leo Costelli's gallery on East 77th Street. Featuring hand-painted images of everyday objects, the show was an instant sensation and sold out almost overnight. Two months later, Jasper John's close friend and lover, Robert Rauschenberg, had his own one-man show at the Costelli Gallery, featuring images drawn from newspapers, magazines, street signs, and advertisements. At a stroke, the fortress of abstraction had started to crumble. Jasper Johnson and Bob Rauschenberg were kind of the, the bridge figures out of first generation abstract expressionism into the pop style. I mean, when you consider those little sculptures of Jasper's that he did in the middle 50s, early on, a saffron coffee can with paintbrushes, the two ale cans, the root from those sculptures into the soup can becomes more obvious. Sometime probably as early as 1958, Warhol had decided that he was going to become not just a painter, but he was going to become an avant-garde painter. He was going to become a painter like Jasper Johns, like Robert Rauschenberg, like Frank Stella. To Warhol's dismay, however, Johns and Rauschenberg would have nothing to do with him, in part because of his commercial background, which they shared but openly disdained, and in part because of his sexuality, which they also shared but which, to protect their careers, they kept carefully screened from public view. After repeated attempts to approach the new stars ended in failure, 
Warhol turned to a close mutual friend, Emile D'Antonio, in despair. Why don't they like me, he asked. Why can't I see them? Why can't I be a painter? Because you're a commercial artist, D'Antonio replied, and because you're too swish and campy. There was nothing I could say to that. It was all too true. I decided I just wasn't going to care because those were all things that I didn't want to change, that I didn't think I should want to change. Dee was the only person I knew then who could see past those old social distinctions to the art itself. Very clearly, from the beginning of his painting career, he goes to a subject matter that's vernacular. He goes to images that appear in the press. And by early 61, Warhol was creating the first paintings that we would come to think of as his pop paintings. But it's a very decisive moment in his career. In the winter of 1961, on the second floor of his townhouse on Lexington Avenue, he set to work. Beginning as Johns and Rauschenberg had, with pre-existing images and vernacular subjects, from the very start, he showed a willingness to go much farther than his predecessors. Seeking out the cheapest and most bluntly graphic images he could find, crudely drawn black and white ads for nose jobs, wigs, television sets, refrigerators, storm doors, and foot medications, clipped from tabloid newspapers and downmarket magazines, and from the back pages of comic books. The popular fantasy is that the artist is this Promethean inventor who, out of nothing, invents and creates. And Andy was the exact reverse of that. He was pure receptivity. He's receptive to everything, and then something happens. He chooses. He's the reverse of an expressionist painter. He's the reverse of somebody who imposes himself, his pattern, his vision, his energy, whatever it is on things. As I say, he's a recording machine, and I think that's what's different. I think that he, he, he's a mirror. He reflects life rather than sort of projecting life. How he begins to make paintings is very interesting because technically, in many ways, it's of a piece with how he made drawings. He always works from a found image. Initially, he uses illustrations, a line illustration. There's no tone, there's no shadow. They're stark, black and white, line, cut images, usually taken from advertisements. And he enlarges the image in an opaque projector, projects the image on the wall, and he would literally trace the projected image on the wall, sometimes using pencil, but initially painting freehand over the projected image. I mean, I think he was steeped in film culture and the culture of products and consumption. And he was populist enough or common enough or grounded enough to take that realm ultra seriously. I think it's because he had a terrific eye, was in some sense an art director or a window dresser or a manager of environments before he was a fine artist. And so he knew all about the hook, the seduction, the subliminal ploy to draw somebody in. And he had done a lot of research in American looking, American desire. During this time that Worrell's making these works, he's not, he hasn't given up his day job. I mean, he's still doing commercial design. He's still doing window design. He worked for Bonwit Teller Department Store and did a number of windows. Every year, the commercial artist would be given a show, if they wanted, of the work they were doing in their serious time. So Warhol did a selection of these hand-painted images. Little King, an advertisement painting, made their first appearance, fittingly, one could say, in Bonwit Teller's store. He had been working in a vacuum for nearly a year, unsold and all but unexhibited when he was introduced to two men destined to play a crucial role in the pop art movement. Ivan Karp, a dapper, fast-talking assistant to the art dealer, Leo Costelli, who tried without success to convince his employer to take Warhol on. And Henry Gelzaller, a brilliant 29-year-old curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, who would become one of pop art's most ardent champions. When I saw Warhol, 
Lichtenstein, Oldenburg, and Wesselman within a four-month period. I had a sitting up in bed kind of feeling, thinking something very strange was going on in the art world. Ivan Karp. From the start, it was clear to both Karp and Gelsaller that Warhol had the talent and temperament to go much farther than any of the others. The radical thing that takes place is he makes a series of pictures in which he eliminates the drip, the brushwork. And this is the thing that he's most uncertain about. And he even said, but can a painting be a painting if it doesn't have drips? So he invites four people to his studio, Emile D'Antonio, Irving Blum, Ivan Karp, and Henry Geltzahler. And he shows them the messy version and the tight version. And every one of them prefers the tighter version. In looking at a pristine version of the Coca-Cola painting, D'Antonio remarks, Andy, it's naked, it's brutal, it's who we are. You know, this is something that looks more like his commercial art than it does what he thought high art should be about. And this is radical for him. By 1962, he's virtually expunged all brush marks from his painting. They become increasingly non-painterly. They also become increasingly flat in the sense that color is applied without any medium tones. They're applied in pure hues. There's no shade, there's no space in the paintings. There's no space for our eye to move through it like a traditional painting or even like an abstract painting. And there's no place for our spiritual eye to penetrate it. We're just thrown back on the surface. It's impossible for us to imagine how radical and how risky it must have been at that time to make these kind of works, to you know, slap an image of a comic strip or a Coca-Cola bottle on a canvas is a, is a very radical and in-your-face act. From the start, the response of most members of the art world to Warhol's work was almost uniformly hostile. I thought the paintings were terrible, one gallery owner said. I thought they were ridiculous. Warhol himself, another dealer observed, looked like something that had crawled out from under a rock. He was the most colossal creep I had ever seen in my life. Despite Karp and Gelsaller's zealous efforts on his behalf, no dealers were willing to exhibit his work. There are still artists, and still people in the art world, who feel that everything he did was anathema to art, that it killed the spirit in art. There was the flatness of the technique, the fact that it was not painterly, and most people saw that as a kind of blasphemy. Many people who were involved in making art felt that this was basically anti-art. Even sympathetic visitors, like Irving Blum, a gallery owner from Los Angeles, were baffled by what they saw. And I went to see him. He was doing these big, unfinished cartoon paintings. There was a pile of them, and I couldn't make head or tail out of them. I remember very distinctly I was confused and not engaged, not engaged. However, engaged by the guy. At the beginning, at that time in his life, uh, nothing if not completely accessible. By the end of 1961, Warhol was the only member of the pop art movement whose works remained unshown. One night in early December, he outlined a situation to two close friends, Ted Carey and Muriel Latow, and asked them what to do. It's too late for cartoons, he said. I've got to do something that will have a lot of impact, that will be different from Lichtenstein and Rosenquist, that will be very personal, that won't look like I'm doing exactly what they're doing. Muriel, you've got fabulous ideas. Can you give me one? Without missing a beat, Lato replied, you like money, she said simply. You should paint pictures of money, then added almost as an afterthought. You should paint something that everybody sees every day, that everybody recognizes like a can of soup. For the first time that evening, Warhol smiled. The next morning, dispatching Julia to the AMP with orders to bring back all 32 varieties of soup the Campbell's Soup Company made, he began to experiment with a variety of approaches, focusing in the end on what struck him as the simplest strategy, 32 separate single can paintings, each showing a different variety of soup painstakingly rendered in the style he had been perfecting for nearly a year. 
he would return to the subject again and again over the next few months. The idea that the way you are induced to look at something is as much about making it art as what it is. That is to say, if the artist can make you look at anything as if it were art, it to some degree becomes art. If you contemplate a telephone, a glass of water, a light fixture, in the context of the highlighted uselessness of art, it will change its nature to your perception. That in other words, perception is what makes art as much as whatever is inherent in the object you're looking at. He was still working on the series, one morning in early May, 1962, when Irving Blum called to say that he was back in town. He said, come over. I'd love to see you, Irving. And I walked in through the door, and in the corridor were several soup can paintings lined up on the floor. And I looked at them and said, what are these? And he said, my new work. It's what I'm doing now. It's what I've been doing for a short while. And I said, what happened to the cartoons? And he said, you know, Irving, I went to Leo's gallery, and Ivan Karp showed me some transparencies. And there's a guy doing these cartoons in a much more finished way than I was doing these cartoons of mine. In any case, he said, I had the idea for these soups, and it's what I'm working on now. He said, there are 32 varieties of Campbell soup chili beef, chicken, consomme, <laughs> whatever. And he said, I'm going to do 32, then figure out what I'm going to do next. And we continued to talk, and somehow I became engaged by them. And I said to Andy, would you be willing to show them in California? He said, yes, let's do it. And that was how that happened. The soup cans would prove to be the turning point of Andy Warhol's career, providing him with the unmistakable artistic signature he had been looking for. That month, as he prepared for his exhibit at the Ferris Gallery in July, Time magazine ran a full-page article about the pop art style, ridiculing the movement, but featuring a photograph of Warhol himself, standing in front of one of his paintings, pretending to sip Campbell's soup from a can. Over the next three months, as the fame he had longed for all his life began to build and grow, he would make the most important artistic breakthrough of his career, one that would permanently fuse the form and content of his art and give it permanent, lasting power. There's something that almost never varies in Warhol's work from August of 62 until the day he dies, and that's the use of the photograph and the silkscreen technique. It's consistent throughout the 60s into the 70s and beyond. And of course, he had always been intimately involved with the world of reproduced images. And certainly by 62, he's very involved with this notion of repetition, with the image repeating again and again within the painting. We call it seriality. There's the frame of the painting, and then there's the repeating image of it. He goes through a series of carved stamps, which he uses to make the SNH green stamp paintings, various stamp paintings. And then he begins to move to hand cut stencils, where he actually would draw an image and then cut the stencil out. So it still isn't quite photographic now. It's still hand drawn in this way, but it's moving in that direction. Following the suggestion of his assistant, Nathan Gluck, he began sending out his drawings to be photomechanically silkscreened, a commercial technique that involved transferring an image onto a fine meshed screen through which ink could be pressed to produce an infinite number of copies. You get the same image, slightly different each time, he remembered. It was all so simple, quick and chancy. I was thrilled by it. The first silkscreen paintings probably come from as early as April of 1962. These silkscreens were from illustrated material. He wasn't using photographs. He was using an illustration of a Coca-Cola bottle and of dollar bills. And he had to draw the dollar bill. He sent that to a silkscreen maker. And with these silkscreens, he made his first silkscreen paintings. 
By the summer of 62, the technique evolves. It evolves from drawing to the photograph. He learns that he can actually have a photograph reproduced photomechanically onto a silk screen. As best as we can date it, Warhol says his first photo silk screen painting was a painting called Baseball. And then the movie star paintings followed shortly afterwards. The paintings of Troy Donahue, Teen Stars, uh, Warren Beatty, Natalie Wood. That is the radical departure. Once he wed that silk screen with the painting, once photography became embedded within painting in a way it had never been before, he never goes back to using those other techniques again. And this sets up a completely different way for him to operate and, in a sense, makes evident the source materials that he's been using all along. And this is fundamental. He marries form and content in a way that's inextricable. You cannot pull them apart. By the time you get to the silkscreen image and you actually look at something that exists in the culture through reproduction, exists in his painting as reproduction, you cannot tear it apart. And of course, that's, that's the thing that really makes for great art. He pushed the language forward. That's the thing we want from great artists. And Warhol did that. On July 9, 1962, Warhol's Soup Can Show, his first major exhibit as a fine artist, opened at the Ferris Gallery in West Hollywood to scanty sales, and at first, a deafening silence from the critics. Zero. Zero. There was no critical response. I mean, the most entertaining critical response uh, came from a guy called David Stewart, who had a gallery three doors away from where my gallery was, and he went to the local Safeway store bought 20 Campbell soup cans, put them in the window, and said, buy them more cheaply here. <laughs> in other words, 27 cents. <laughs> but people were mystified or dismissive, or dismissive. But because the gallery was serious, people thought about them. But having more to do, I promise you, more to do with me and my reputation, then, with the paintings themselves, that was the mistake that was made. In the end, something about the provocative paintings seemed to touch a deep and powerful chord. Here was an image, Henry Gelsoller declared, that became the overnight rallying point for the sympathetic and the bane of the hostile. Warhol captured the imagination of the media and the public as no other artist of his generation. Andy was pop, and pop was Andy. Most critics dismissed the paintings as a vulgar joke, but a young writer named John Copeland's, founder of a new journal called Art Forum, praised them as the greatest breakthrough in art since the ready-mades of Marcel Duchamp half a century earlier. The power of the cans, first of all, in a hundred years, you won't buy soup in cans. I mean, this defines a time. It tells you about marketing. It tells you about advertising. It tells you about food distribution. And I always found them, as I sat looking at them from time to time, for lack of anything else to do, complicated. In their implication, complicated. And I find them to this day complicated. In their implication. That was his genius. That was his genius, I think. And they really, more than any other image, more than any other symbol, define the pop style and 60s activity. They have a cerebral aspect. They have a literal aspect. Like any great work of art, they're complex. After 10 days or two weeks, into the exhibition, I called Andy and I said, the experience of living with the work has been so powerful to me for reasons I can't even tell you. I'm just struck by the paintings, Andy, in a way that I, I couldn't imagine at the beginning, but I can tell you that I think they're really powerful and I think they're terribly important and I'd like to keep the set 
intact. He said, Irving, they were conceived as a group. And he said, I'd love it if you could do it. And I said, I can promise you this, Andy. I can promise you I will never break them up. I will keep them intact. And I can also promise you, I don't know how we're going to do this, but I can promise you that one day they'll go to a great museum. I said, what will I have to pay you for the group? And he said, $1,000 for the 32 paintings. And over a 10 month period, I sent him $100 a month until I got to the end of it. Well, I can tell you exactly what they're worth now. I sold them six years ago for $15 million intact to the Museum of Modern Art, and they have them intact, just as I promised. In addition to the 32 paintings which I showed in California, Andy did four or five. One of them was auctioned off two nights ago at Christie's, the single painting, for $2,200,000. So, uh, when you consider I had 32 times 2 million, plus the fact that they're intact has a value, my guess, and I don't think I exaggerate, would be uh, a value of, I think, $100 million. In other words, I think they're invaluable. They're invaluable. They're irreplaceable and invaluable. He just did it, and he didn't know how to do it. He had the drive, the desire, the need to be beyond anything. He had to be at least as great as Marilyn Monroe. He knew that's where power of life was, the burning flame. Because for so many years, he was so plain and fascinated with beauty himself, and he knew that beauty has that magnetism that attracts people, and he didn't have that. So he developed another kind of magnetism, the stardom. Because there is real life power in fame and stardom. So that, that, that movie star in the spotlight, being a star and not wanting to go beyond that. And he, he eventually eclipsed the fame of his work with the fame of his individual nature. What artist of any sort has had more to say about the nature of fame in the 20th century than Andy Warhol? It was one of his leading themes. It was one of his subjects in the most profound way. He thought about it with a depth and an originality and an insight and showed it in his work with a kind of striking, inescapable force that's beyond that of any competitor I can think of. In addition, he was constantly focusing on what struck him as beautiful. He was an aesthete. He was somebody who was interested in what was beautiful. And what was beautiful shone for him. To shine like a star was to be beautiful. So beauty and fame went together in his mind. I think, in addition, it was a kind of immortality, a way of keeping going of keeping the moment so it wouldn't vanish on you and disappear and be lost. Over the next 18 months, as his own career took off with a speed and intensity unparalleled in the annals of contemporary culture, Andy Warhol would finish defining the major themes and subjects that would absorb the rest of his career in one of the most astonishing bursts of artistic creativity in the 20th century. So many of the paintings that we think of as the great paintings, of course, of the 60s, from the soup cans to the death paintings, the Maryland paintings were made before the factory. In the period 61, 63, there's a tremendous outpouring of work. This is sort of the efflorescence of the first moment of celebrity culture. You know, I mean, the first moment in which we really let celebrity stand for us. You know, I can date it exactly to Andy's great year, 1962. For 40 years, Norman Rockwell had been painting pictures of everyday Americans. 
1962, Andy starts painting pictures of presidents and heroes and movie stars. On August 4th, 1962, the same day the soup can show closed in West Hollywood, news flashed across the country that the actress Marilyn Monroe had committed suicide in her Brentwood home just three miles away. Warhol, acting on a suggestion of Henry Gelsaller, immediately decided to make the doomed star the subject of his next series of silk screens. I think that Andy had what Henry James called the imagination of disaster, and Henry Gelsaller saw it. Andy was always about listening to suggestions. He was always saying, I'm tabula rasa. Please fill me with something. Tell me something. Well, Henry fed him ideas. He fed him ideas about Marilyn. That is to say, why is timing everything? He set out on a Marilyn series the day Marilyn died. Using a still from her 1953 film Niagara, he added a new twist to the silk screening technique, painting grounds of vivid color in the locations of her head, lips, and shoulders, then silk screening the black and white photograph over it. What commentators have noticed is that the color comes first. The background color comes first, and the drawing comes second. It's just complete reversal of what the usual order of things in painting. There's underdrawing, and then you paint on top of it. Not Warhol. Warhol painted first, used color first, painted by hand, in fact, first, and then screened on top of it. All through August and on into September, he painted one Marilyn after another, 23 in all, from a small single image canvas known as Gold Marilyn to an immense diptych with 100 images, half in color, half black and white, arrayed across a canvas nearly 12 feet wide. As with his blotted line technique before, random imperfections often crept into the work, marring the surface of each canvas. Background colors often fail to register with the photographic image, and through repeated use, the silk screens became clogged with paint, giving the doomed movie star a slightly different expression in each portrait. When Nathan Gluck pointed out the discrepancies, Warhol dismissed him. I like it that way, he said. It's part of the art. Guess what Andy's genius was? That he had a way of making everything mean. Every detail means something. Every mark or splatter or sign of accident or lack of the hand or of intention in Warhol's symbolic universe has a meaning. And he was enough of a minimalist to leave objects alone so that they could speak their double or triple meanings. What Andy understood is the painting of Marilyn Monroe doesn't necessarily just represent Marilyn, it represents you. Take the lifesaver Marilyns. There's a mint one, there's a green one, there's an orange one, you know, all these different flavors. What this implies is we all want Marilyn. She's the object of our desire. We cannot have Marilyn, but we can have the picture of Marilyn that suits our taste. So in a sense, we are all one in our desire for what we can't have. We individuate ourselves in what color we want our desire to come in. And I think that was pretty much Andy's, Andy's view of the thing. We all want Campbell, some of us want the bean. You know what I mean? That's a pretty consistent language of imagery in Warhol. In other words, not that we get what we want, it's that everybody understands that we're wanting creatures and that we're one in that particular theater. In the end, Marilyn was only the first of Warhol's extraordinary meditations on the function of fame in a mass society. Grasping that stars were never truer to themselves than when the brilliance that sustained them began to fade away, he turned to his portraits of Elizabeth Taylor and the aftermath of her disastrous turn as Cleopatra, as her health deteriorated and her love life came apart and her career began to implode. I started those, he later said, when she was so sick and everybody thought she was going to die. Now I'm doing them all over, putting bright colors on her lips and eyes. He understood all of the paradoxes of stardom and he was the greatest philosopher of stardom that has ever lived, Andy Warhol was. Andy understood intuitively the implosiveness of one identity being made that big. 
it's the stuff of nightmares. I've often thought, what a nightmare to be Liz in a way and wake up one morning and go, oh my God, I'm known over the whole world, which is Andy's dream. But that's a kind of imperial conquest that decimates the world and also decimates the individual who is thus made available. One painting that I can think of quite vividly is Blue Liz as Cleopatra. And it's the way the image seems to be a film strip or just a strip of celluloid that can be read as continuous action if it were projected, but that's not being projected, so it's somehow discarded image. And a discarded image of a human being in motion, a desired, objectified, beautiful, famous human being in motion, turned into a series of still portraits and then discarded. It's outtake footage. It's mangled and ripped. It's censored footage. It's the stuff on the cutting room floor. It's literally in the dust heap. So Warhol takes Liz and he dyes her blue. And understanding that Liz is on the verge of becoming garbage, he's going to rescue her, rescue this strip, and render it as a painting. And it essentially is sensibility is entirely mourning and melancholy that Liz is lost she's already lost and she will never be found she will never be there as summer turned to fall his energies exploded unleashed by the possibilities of the silkscreen technique and by the demands of preparing for not one but two major exhibitions later that fall in three months he completed more than a hundred paintings his studio one man later said looked and smelled as if it had been hit by a paint bomb I feel very much a part of my times, of my culture, Warhol told a newspaper reporter in late September. As much a part of it as rockets or television. That phrase, I am a camera, applied more to Andy than to anybody else. It wasn't just a camera. I mean, I am a recording machine. I am the mirror to the world. And any kind of recording of this incredibly dramatic period in our lives is enormously important, and I think Andy got it more graphically and more really than anybody else. That although there is this sort of mysterious sort of flimsiness to his work, there is a kind of reality. He got it. He got it by accepting it and by letting it impress itself on him, on his work, on everything about him. And who else has done that? He wanted to steal as much reality as possible. He was voracious and acquisitive toward reality. At every moment, good art is happening to our right and left, and we're missing it. On October 31st, 1962, the first group show of the pop art movement opened at the Janus Gallery. One week later, on November 6th, 1962, Warhol's first one-man show in New York opened at the Stable Gallery on West 58th Street and took the world by storm. Gathering together 18 of his best paintings to date, it established him almost overnight as first among equals in the pop art movement and as one of the most important figures in contemporary American art. Henry Geltzoller, Ivan Karp, and Emil D'Antonio were all there, vindicated in their tenacious belief in his talent. Leo Castelli stood in the corner, his eyes narrowed, acknowledging that he had been profoundly mistaken about Warhol's prospects. Alone amidst the revelry and high spirits, Warhol himself seemed distant and withdrawn, remaining in a corner of the gallery for most of the evening, his face unusually blank. His eyes were soft, expressive. They were the eyes of a fragile night creature who has discovered himself living in the blaze of an alien but fascinating world. Even critics skeptical of his earlier work now began to acknowledge the sheer pictorial power of the new images. Warhol's paintings, the writer Ron Sukunik declared, represented America's first real break with European ideals. The images of Marilyn, he added, were about as sentimental as Ford's coming off the assembly line, each one a different color, but each one the same as every other. We were seeing the future, and we knew it for sure. We saw people walking around in it without knowing it, because they were still thinking in the past, in the reference of the past. But all you had to do was know you were in the future, and that's what put you there. The mystery was gone, but the amazement was just starting. I think Andy wanted to be remembered by history. He wanted to be the most important artist of his time. He wanted to be Picasso. He was kind of obsessed with competing with Picasso on many levels. I think his motivation was part superficial and part frivolous, personal, and part very noble in a way, you know? He really wanted to record the times. He really wanted to figure it out. He really wanted to leave something.
With his artwork in demand as never before, Warhol resolved to step up production. In January 1963, he moved his studio from the parlor of his townhouse, no longer large enough to accommodate his larger paintings, to the third floor of an abandoned red brick firehouse a few blocks away on East 87th Street. In June, to increase production still further, he took on a new assistant, a 20-year-old college student from the Bronx named Gerard Malanga, who had learned how to silkscreen a few years before while working for a necktie manufacturer. The more you look at Warhol's work, the more you look at Warhol, the more you see a mind constantly engaged in the studio. We see him making a series of decisions in the studio, how one painting leads to another painting, how one series leads to another painting. And there are a series of insights, and you get a sort of logic almost that unfolds in the studio that's of an intensely committed and engaged sophisticated and thoughtful artist. A series of images follow that are a series of action images, narrative images. The paintings that we've come to call the death paintings. It's probably not long after Marilyn's suicide in August of 62 when he begins to do his first paintings of car crashes. And he comments in a very famous interview that he turns on the radio, it's a holiday, and he hears about death everywhere mundane death as a highway fatality. Henry Gale Sorrell fed him the idea of the disaster series. These horrible photographs that used to appear in the tabloid newspapers of New York of these grotesque, horrible accidents transformed into this arresting, unforgettable series. Now, where does that come from? I mean, I can talk about where it comes from philosophically, but it also was always there someone who was that tuned to the immediate moment. Timing is everything. What makes him act? A suggestion about death. You should do these pictures, Andy. Probably Henry Gelser has said it to him 200 times, but that one worked. I wanted Andy to get serious, Henry Gelser recalled. I said, it's enough life. It's time for a little death. I thought that people should think about them sometime. The girl who jumped off the Empire State Building, or the ladies who ate the poisoned tuna fish, and the people getting killed in car crashes. It's not that I feel sorry for them. It's just that people go by, and it doesn't really matter to them that someone unknown was killed. So I thought it'd be nice for these unknown people to be remembered by those who ordinarily wouldn't think of them. Harsh and unnerving, based on photographs taken from news agencies, police files, and tabloid newspapers, the so-called death and disaster paintings were not immediately popular. Most gallery owners simply refused to exhibit them. Most of Warhol's work has a very grim and terrible side. He never hit it. He never claimed anything other than that. But he himself seemed touched with magic. He had found a way to overcome these tremendous, obvious liabilities and flourish in this culture and be someone who seemed like he had put himself into the realm of the blessed. And yes, I think because that was connected to him, the grim message of a lot of his art was ignored in favor of the sort of with it perfect, on top of it all look. Andy's attitude toward women was very complicated. He admired them. He wanted to be one. He wanted to be involved in their creation. Ethel Skull, 36 times, was the most successful portrait of the 1960s. It was a new kind of look at a single human being from 36 different points of view, obviously influenced by cinema and television. He was creating an image of a superstar out of a woman who could have been any one of a series of women, Henry Geldzahler. In the summer of 1963, he embarked on his first commissioned work, 
a portrait of the art collector Ethel Skull, based on a series of photographs he had made of her wearing outfits by Yves Saint Laurent. I had great visions of going to Richard Avedon, seeing uh, I mean, magnificent pictures of me taken, and then he would do the portrait. And so he came up for me that day, and he said, all right, we're off. And I said, where are we going? He says, down to 42nd Street and Broadway. I said, what are we going to do there? He says, I'm going to take pictures of you. I said, for what? He said, for the portrait. I said, in those things? I said, my God, I'll look terrible. He said, don't worry. And he took out, he had coins, about $100 worth of silver coins. He said, we'll take the high key and the low key, and I'll push you inside, and you watch the little red light. And I froze. Now start smiling and talking, Warhol told his willing client, as he began dropping quarters into the machine. This is costing me money. So Andy would come in and poke me and make me do all kinds of things. We were running from one booth to the other, and he took all these pictures, and they were drying all over the place. And at the end of the thing, he said, now you want to see them. And they were so sensational that you didn't need Richard Avedon, you see. From the 300 images he took that day, he initially selected 35, enlarging, silk screening, and individually inking each image, then adding one more to make an even 36. The finished work was so big, a friend remembered, it had to be assembled in place on the skull's living room wall. But what I liked about it mostly was that it was a, a portrait of being alive and not like those candy box things, which I detest, you see, I never ever wanted a portrait of myself. And he was very clever because he knows I'm nearsighted. I wear sunglasses. And he said, let's have them with the glasses and without the glasses. And he directed me, I tell you, in those days, he should have already been in the movies, <laughs> you know, or doing movies. By probably the middle of 63, there's another insight that starts happening. And it changes the whole way he begins to think about the serial or repetitive nature of the image which is to say, rather than producing a single large painting in which the image repeats again and again, he begins to create single images that are smaller and assemble them together in series. It gives him a lot more flexibility, and in fact, he can create many more paintings, and in fact, he can totally undermine any idea of composition. There is no composition in advance. There is just the montage, just how you put the units together. Increasingly now, his interests were moving towards film. In July, he bought a second-hand Bolex and convinced a friend to let him film him while he slept. That fall, Irving Blum asked him to put on a second show in Los Angeles. He said, for the 63 show, why don't we ring the gallery with Elvis's? And he said, you have a space behind the gallery. We can show Liz Taylor portraits, which I'm doing now, back there. So it would be a kind of a dialogue between these two people. And he said, uh, I think it might work very well. And I, I told him I thought it would be brilliant. And at a moment, a big coffin-like crate arrived and it was an unbroken roll of Elvis images and I called Andy and I said how do I handle this and he said you cut them I've sent you another crate of stretcher bars and he said I printed it so that there are single images double images and triple images of Elvis and he said Irving cut them and I said cut them he said yes cut them he said cut them on the ground he said don't cut the image and I said, right. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. And hung them cheek by jowl around the gallery. People hated it. They hated it. And I had the Liz Taylors, 10 identical paintings on a silver ground, black hair, flesh colored face, all screened. However, each one subtly different and incredibly powerful and really amazing to see. While he was in Hollywood, he shot footage for a silent film called Tarzan and Jane, featuring Dennis Hopper and the underground film star, Taylor Mead. Hopper himself threw a glamorous star-studded party for him with a guest list that included Sal Mineo and Troy Donahue. 
It was the most exciting thing that had ever happened to him, Warhol later said. And he returned to New York more starstruck than ever. Being a star was an absolute dream of his, a friend recalled. But he didn't want to just be a movie star. He wanted to be the head of the studio. I think he was inspired by the underground film scene in New York, which he was very tuned into. He understood that film was had entered the hands of artists um, and was available to him. And as he began to tap film imagery in his paintings, and as he began to, one could say, get in touch with his inner star, and began to realize his own dream of stardom, probably became piercingly clear that he needed to make movies as a way of being the movies. So it seems to me unsurprising that he would wish to make films himself. On the afternoon of November 22nd, 1963, Warhol was walking through Grand Central Station when news flashed across the country that President Kennedy had been shot an hour before while on a political tour of Dallas. Rushing uptown, he sat stunned on a couch, watching the live television coverage unfold in real time unable to hold back tears. I don't know what it means, one friend remembered him saying over and over again. In the months to come, selecting eight grainy images of the president's widow just before and after her husband's murder, he would create an extended series of single and multiple image paintings. One 16-panel composition in particular would capture, as perhaps no other artwork of the time, the profound cultural and psychic rupture John F. Kennedy's assassination represented. He understood instantaneously. The second Liz turned into Liz, which was with her tracheotomy and her sexual scandals in the early 60s, and with Jackie, the second JFK was shot, just to understand that instantly they were incomprehensible spectacles that would make one speechless to contemplate, and he got that immediately. He was able to grasp via something like the Jacqueline Kennedy portrait, that America lives in terms of images, right? And that woman, you know, in mourning, the famous one of her with the head uh, down, that she held the nation together for three terrifying days when it was very vulnerable. By her image in mourning, right? He understood this and he captured it and reproduced it. For two more years, Warhol would continue working at the top of his form as a pop painter and continue producing masterpieces on canvas to the end of his life. And yet already, by the end of 1963, the focus of his interests had begun to shift. In the months and years to come, as the centrifugal energies of the 1960s began to pick up speed, he would begin to move into the deeper dimensionality of sculpture and into the deeper temporality of film. As he did, the setting in which he produced his art would shift as well, from the semi-isolation of the firehouse studio to the dizzyingly complex social universe of a new kind of workplace, the factory, which would become not only the setting in which his art was created, but itself the most radical, ambiguous, and troubling work of art he ever made. Well, whatever comes along. And like somebody called up yesterday, a girl, and she said, I have a script called Up Your Ass. And I thought the uh, title was so great, and, and I was so friendly, I just told her to come up. But, but she still, you know, we haven't seen her yet, so I don't know, again. She, she thought that would be just the thing for Andy. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. Does it sound that they feel one way rather than another about you? Uh, oh, I don't really understand. Well, you should just tell me the words and I can...
I'm not gonna stop you.